huge crowd. I guess you all really wanted to hear about the supposed leak from a supposed person about an organization that had a set of really neat tools, supposedly. Uh, so these guys aren't talking about classified material. They're talking about something supposedly that they read on the internet and might have re replicated. We're also talking about Yeah, with that, we're talking about classified material. All right, so they may be talking about classified material, maybe. Uh, so anyway, without any further ado, uh, NSA playset, uh, playset uh, USB tools. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, good morning. You're a lot chirpier than I am. Um, right, my name is Dominic Spell. Uh, this is Michael Osman. Um, he's very shy and retiring. You may not have seen him in public before. Uh, this is Jared Boone, and um, we're presenting on uh, the NSA playset USB tools. Um, does anyone want to give a little introduction as to who they are? No? Okay. Uh, we'll get to it. We'll get, we'll get to it. it. Well, people will work out who we are. People will figure it out. Um, so, unlike, unlike was just mentioned, uh, this presentation does contain some leaked classified content. Um, so, if you're not allowed to look at it. Sorry. Um, Bye. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I mean, there was best fun. Yeah, and, and people are. Um, uh, so we actually, we actually agonized over the decision yeah, we, we quite really, a bit. We really agonized over this decision, and then we read our abstract that was on the Schmoocon website, and the abstract contains samples of the leaked material that we're about to show you. So if you've read the abstract <laughs> and decided to come to the talk, like, yeah, yeah you were, sorry. Turns out we're jerks. Uh, yeah, we are kind of, kind of jerks. Um, that's, uh, oh. oh, man, I'm so sorry. Wow. That was far more people than I was expecting. <laughs> I'm also interested in the people leaving now, like, clearly didn't think about it. <laughs> okay. So there are some seats up the front which have become available. <laughs> if anyone's interested in moving down. Uh, so, anyway. So, so as long as everyone's comfortable, the next slide may contain some leaked information. All right? Everybody who's left wants to leave. All right. So uh, there was a catalog called the AMP catalog, uh, which was leaked at some point. It was published uh, December 2013, uh, around the time of CCC. And um, it contained various gadgets uh, that, and capabilities that the NSA had, um, largely based around hardware implants. And uh, there were some software vulnerabilities in there as well, and, and other tools. Um, and this talk largely um, covers some projects which we were already working on at that time, and, and one new project that's, that's entirely based on, on these um, leaked documents. But it also uh, generally contains things which are very similar and capabilities that uh, we have as a community um, that the people who recently left the room already had. Um, and they've gone. They can't hear me. Um, so. Uh, um, one of them, uh, and the, the main one uh, that we like to focus on, is called Cottonmouth One. And Cottonmouth One is a USB um, implant inside a cable. And we'll come on to some more details of our own um, version of this and um, what you might want to use this for uh, later in the talk. Um, there are other ones in there, which is Cottonmouth Two, which is incredibly similar to Cottonmouth One, but is used in collaboration with a second uh, implant that does uh, long-range um, wireless um, data exfiltration. And Cottonmouth 3, which with, like the description on, the, on this uh, section of the document is slightly strange. There's a lot of it is copied and pasted from Cottonmouth 1, and like they haven't even changed the name of the product in there at one point, or, like it's, it, it, it's, a, it's not entirely clear, and um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the, these NSA playset talks and projects and things are, um, our interpretation of the tools we'd like to and kind of inspired. We're not, we're not trying to build exactly the same tool. We're trying to build a useful tool by taking inspiration from uh, these, uh, this document. So, and that's the end of the classified material. Ish. 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 All right. Yeah. Well, uh, so <coughs> I'm going to talk um, about USB proxy. And USB proxy is a tool, it's an open source tool that I released at uh, Shmoocon last year. Um, 
and it's for doing playing around with uh, USB 2, um, so anything up to about 480 megabits. Um, it's for writing devices, it's for um, doing man in the middle attacks, for monitoring connections, it's for doing uh, sort of exploration of, of uh, protocols that you, you know, don't necessarily have access to documentation for. Um, so it's, it's a C++ library that takes a USB device and a USB host controller and just forwards packets between them and allows us to manipulate them in the middle. Uh, I base it on LibUSB and GadgetFS, which is um, a kernel module that allows me to represent a USB device as a, a file system. And it's a very simple way for me to copy the, descriptor, the USB descriptors from a device and um, present myself as that device to a, to a target. And I like to run this on the BeagleBone Black, which I can't hold. Oh, I've got a picture. Sorry. There it is. There's a picture. <laughs> so that's the BeagleBone Black. That's the, the one I'll be using today, um, the slightly battered one that I carry around with me. Um, one of the reasons I like using the BeagleBone Black is uh, it's open source hardware. Um, and, and we're kind of big on that. We love that. So um, it has a, um, a TI something chip on it that features a USB um, device controller. And originally what happened is uh, Travis Goodspeed said, hey, does anyone want to make a face dancer that works with the, the Beagle board to, to remove some of the speed limitations on the face dancer? And I went off and designed this as a kind of my first hardware project. And I presented my finished board to Mike, and Mike said, that's great. I'm really glad you got into hardware and, and played around with this. But you know you can do everything FaceDOS can do in software on the BeagleBone. And I was like, really? OK, I'll do that again. And I've spent the past year to 18 months in my spare time uh, working on this and, and developing devices um, in software and trying to develop some of the FaceDancer capabilities um, in userland software on a piece of hardware that you can just go out and buy. So you don't need to worry about assembling a face dancer. You um, don't need to worry about trying to buy a face dancer from um, wherever. You can go and, uh, go and buy one of these $50 boards and put a, a Linux OS image on it and then just um, run my code and it, it should present itself as a USB man in the middle device and it should present itself as a um, various USB devices and things like that. Um, and this is just an overview of how it works. This, is, this hasn't changed since last year, but I, I wasn't sure if anyone had seen my talk last year. Um, so what we have is we have this little relay in the middle that just forwards packets around, and we're able to inject packets into it. We're able to filter packets, and by filter I mean we're just able to manipulate them in the middle for man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, at B-Sides Las Vegas earlier this year, I did, some, I did I gave a presentation on manipulating USB mass storage devices. So I could do things like block writes to the mass storage device by having this filter in the middle that said, if I tried to write a file named XYZ, then block the write, otherwise allow the writes to happen. Or um, there are like, manipulations like that, um, because there was you know, a lot of stuff about persistence of malware on, on USB drives and things like that. Uh, and the filters also let us do things like dump to PCAP so we can analyze protocols. So USB proxy has now been used to um, reverse engineer the Xbox 360 controllers. It's been used on the um, Super Smash Brothers Wii U GameCube adapter thing. And it's been used for something with PlayStation as well, which means that its only commercial use is for doing something with game, um, games console controllers. And it's been outright success. Like The best write-up this project has got was on a gaming forum. <laughs> <laughs> and a friend of mine who plays games was like sending me the article going, hey, this guy's using the, the BeagleBone. It's your weapon of choice. And like at the bottom of the article, there's a link to my GitHub repository. I'm like, yeah, he's using my code. And uh, finally, <coughs> finally, my friends think I'm relevant. <laughs> Um, so, so what have we? What have I been doing? I haven't, I haven't been like sitting. Well, I have been sitting around for a year, but um, I've been uh, fixing bugs. So there are a lot of bugs in USB proxy. I mean, a lot of bugs, uh, and some very kind contributors uh, helped me to um, to fix a lot of those. A lot of uh, memory issues, um, all of my own making, and and at some point last year, I happened to mention that hey, maybe it'd be nice if I wrote some Python language bindings so that I can then interface with the face dancer code, and we can just do the face dancer stuff, but through USB proxy. And I didn't realize like, 
quite how seriously everyone took this because <laughs> what I get is about one email a week saying, hey, I love the project, so I'm keen to use it, but I'm, I'm waiting for the Python uh, bindings to work. And I just sort of never got around to them because in my mind, if you want to manipulate USB at the like, byte level, like down at the, at the packet level, but you're afraid of using C, then like, there's, a, there's a disconnect there. But it turns out, actually, I was wrong. And um, lots of people do like using Python for this. It's incredibly <laughs> slow, but it does mean that we're now able to support face dancer. And so I now have access to um, a load of software that's been written for face dancer over the past couple of years that now just works, in some cases, on USB proxy. Uh, so I, I just wanted to include this slide, and I don't know how easy it is to read from the back of the room. But um, I don't know if everyone knows, but when, when uh, Microsoft release a new copy of Internet Explorer every now and again, um, the Firefox team at Mozilla quite often send them a cake. And they've, they've done it this both ways a couple of times. And one of the reasons is that while they might be competing, they are the only groups of people in the world who really know what it takes to write a web browser. And it's a horrible thing to try and write and secure. And I found this uh, when I was going through the face dancer code. And the, the sample at the top is, is face dancer code. And the sample at the bottom is USB proxy code. And while I was going through, I noticed, like, actually, when you come to implement these things, everyone's stumbled across the same problems before and has put the same comment, like, let's not hard code these values in the future. And then they've just hard coded the values. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this has persisted, like this has been in USB proxy for um, maybe only a couple of months, but it's, it's definitely been in, in face dancer for over a year. And so it's, it's nice to see that I'm struggling with the same problems as everyone else. Um, so this, this is the language descriptor. I don't know if you know, but when you plug in a USB device, it sends strings to, to your laptop saying, hey, this is my device identifier. And it can handle different languages for this. And what everyone does is hard code it in English and just uses English for most devices that I've ever seen. And so that's, I feel, a perfectly acceptable thing for us to do in, in uh, USB proxy. And um, I feel that I can get away with that because it's also a perfectly acceptable thing to do in face dancer. So at some point, I will buy Travis a cake. <laughs> so um, uh, just a little note on demos. Um, I, when you see someone present some exploit where they get arbitrary like execute code execution or something on a, on a box, everyone pops calc.exe. And that's not really viable with USB in quite the same way. Uh, so I, I use keyboards because a keyboard is just about a complex enough device to show that like your, your USB code really works, but it's simple enough that you can actually hack it up potentially on the morning of a talk um, <laughs> at, at like 6.30 this morning. Um, so so it, like, it's, it's got enough complexity there that it's not just a, a generic dull device. It's got um, human interface descriptors and things like that, and um, HID descriptors and things like that, that you, you need to know about in order to, to prove that you can, you can implement USB. Um, so my demo is about to be a keyboard. Uh, oh, and very kindly, I found this somewhere in my inbox this morning, where uh, Travis was kind enough to send me an email and say, Hey, feel free to pick on Face Dancer. Um, so it, it is all in good, good faith. Well, not good faith, but good sport. Um, so could you just press up and oh, it's already just press it's return. Arm. So Sorry. I have a I have a bigger bone here <coughs> that is attached to Mike's laptop, and my laptop is running it just over SSH, um, and the code is all running on here. We're just we're just starting and stopping it using using my laptop. Um, so, what it's now doing is running face dancer code, and it tries to pop calc.exe, and that doesn't work. <laughs> Damn it, Osman. So, ah, forgot that. Quite. So, what I was able to do is implement keyboard and just pass it arbitrary strings from my laptop or from the bigger bone or wherever I want, and have it appear on here, as opposed to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you really don't need to applaud that. A lot of people have managed to implement keyboards, so well, uh, specifically keyboard manufacturers. But this is through the face. This is, <laughs> this is so through so face dancer code, right? The, the, the important thing here is I didn't implement a keyboard. What I did was implement a shim layer that means whenever it was that whoever implemented the face dancer keyboard did it, I'm just reusing their code. So all I did was pass it a couple of strings and say, "Hey, try and run count.exe on Mike's laptop and and, and completely off the shelf." And yeah, and and so but the nice thing about this, it runs. Um, using a piece of hardware you can go and buy for $50. It, um, 
is all running in like user space on this device, so you don't need a, a host laptop. It's a lot faster, so if you want to do more complicated devices, um, the data transfer rate is, is much higher and, and things like that. So, um, so yeah, what you saw is it popped up as a, uh, a keyboard, it enumerated, and I can give it any product and manufacturer ID I like. Um, so I can be as subtle as I like, I can um, pretend to be whatever I want, I can change my IDs to get around whitelisting and things like that because they're all just set as variables in Python, um, or I can just pass them into the, the application. Uh, sadly, what you didn't see was Cap.exe. I went to look for this image this morning when I was finishing up the slides. Do you know how many copies of this image are bitmaps? Because that's how old that application is. Mm -hmm. like, I had to search to get a JPEG that I could bring down. Um, so things that I need to, uh, things that I, I plan to do next, and um, given the, the issue with everyone wanting Python bindings, I'm not guaranteeing that I'm going to do these. But uh, if anyone wants to get involved, it's an open source project. I accept all requests all the time, um, sometimes without reading them. Uh, <laughs> so, so last year, we implemented um, USB <coughs> over, over um, Ethernet. And we implemented our own protocol for this uh, because we saw the USB IP uh, project on SourceForge when that's kind of old. We'll just ignore that and write our own protocol. And the reason it was really old is because they'd moved it out of SourceForge and into the kernel. And, um, <laughs> It was released with uh, the Linux kernel 3.17, which means that any sort of fairly up-to-date device will have the ability to do um, USB over, over IP. And it seems like it might be a sensible idea for us to implement the, the same um, protocol over the wire. So um, that's something, if anyone's looking for a student project, get in touch with me, because I would love for someone to do that. Um, there are some strange oddities with the face answer implementation in that there's an excellent fuzzing tool called UMAP that's based on it. And what I didn't realize until after I'd written my Shimlayer is that they'd taken the, US, uh, the face answer libraries and modified them so they don't work with my Shimlayer. Um, so, so I need like a second face answer shim for the other face answer implementations and things. And Travis and I were talking last night about tidying all this up and making it like abstracting it and clever things like that, which seem like a great idea at the bar. And uh, fix all the bugs, because there are loads left. Um, so that's, that's USB proxy. And now I'll let uh, Jared talk about Daisho. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jared Boone. Uh, I'm a hardware hacker who dabbles with uh, security stuff, because I like going to conferences like this. Um, so, in the Ant catalog, I don't recall seeing anything about USB 3. Um, USB 3 has been out for a while, and uh, we happen to be working on a DARPA CFT funded project called Daisho, which was very suitable for hacking on USB 3. So, what I'm presenting here is kind of the first steps toward getting uh, some sort of a man in the middle system set up for USB 3. Uh, so first of all, um, what are the targets available in USB 3? Of course, uh, the firmware and operating system um, of a host computer, uh, the device firmware for whatever peripherals you may be attached to the system. Um, usually the firmware has a lot of weaknesses in it. Uh, and then of course, doing man in the middle on, on a bus. Um, some of the devices I've seen available for USB 3 are kind of interesting as far as man in the middle goes and as far as bulk logging. Um, and exfiltration, uh, particularly host-to-host -host transfer cables like uh, the ones you see at Best Buy where you can copy files between two computers or docking stations where you have a computer that doesn't really, like, like Macs in particular, although they don't usually use USB 3 for docking, um, you know, they don't really have a means to uh, dock them to a station, so you get this USB 3 hub or uh, docking station that has a display adapter and Ethernet and all sorts of other stuff on it. Um, and being able to tap USB 3 would give you almost complete access to everything that that computer is doing while interacting with the user. Uh, so some quick background on how USB 3 works. Uh, of course, it's a serial bus. Uh, unlike USB 2, it's full duplex. So you've got conversations going both directions simultaneously, which kind of simplifies um, doing man in the middle because now you've got two links and you don't have to worry about what direction is the link moving. Um, it, it turns out to be kind of nice. Uh, it's also really fast, so you're dealing with a data flow that is uh, 500 megabytes a second <coughs> over two 5 gigabit links, one in each direction. Um, there's a lot of handshaking that takes place when you first plug in a cable 
uh, to equalize and, and get the, um, the very high speed link to operate well. Um, so there's some complexity involved in dealing with just getting the connection established. Uh, fortunately, there are FIs available for the bus, and so at least we don't have to build that part. Um, so if you're going to build a man-in-the-middle man device, of course, you need some hardware to work on. Um, as I said, the, the uh, link speed is very high. Also, because of that speed, designing a circuit board that has um, PHY interfaces on it is extremely tricky. You're dealing with signals that are multiple gigahertz in speed, in, um, in frequency. And just moving them across a few inches of copper on a circuit board is very, very challenging. Um, the link negotiation protocol is complex. And then on top of that, there is a scrambling layer that is intended primarily to reduce electromagnetic interference so that FCC certification for USB 3 devices is simpler. Uh, you turn the data that's going over the wire from something that's very periodic and consistent into something that resembles white noise, and now your um, electromagnetic emissions goes, go down considerably. So dealing with scrambling, the fact that what you're seeing on the wire is sort of pseudo-randomized is, is an interesting challenge. And lastly, you've got independent clocks on each side of the cable that you have to somehow balance. Um, if you've got a device that's operating at 250 megahertz on one side and 250.001 on the other, you have the potential for having a buffer overflow or underflow if you don't have the means of compensating for that. Um, timing is, of course, critical on a very high-speed bus. Um, even some of the negotiation portions of the protocol happen at the microsecond level, which is very hard to deal with at an operating system level. Um, the data rate is extremely high, and you can't miss a single transfer. You, 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 you have to be extremely deterministic down to the nanosecond level. Um, and then, of course, the scrambling and clock management. Um, there's really no way to do stuff like that in software uh, at this point. So um, FPGAs are pretty much the only answer to solving this problem. Um, they're effectively hardware that you can configure using software and it will execute you know, in, in the half gigahertz range. Uh, so what we, what we did to start with is take the Daisho main board, which is an FPGA-based board that has a generic connector on it. And it's designed to interface to a second board. So you've got these, the stack of two boards. Daisho is, uh, in J Japanese, is basically two swords, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you've got this pairing of boards. One is the, this general purpose high-speed hardware. And the other is some sort of an interface device. And you stack them together, and now you've got a development platform for a particular bus. So um, it's got a USB 3 interface on it, which allows you to get data into and out of the FPGA extremely quickly. Uh, it looks a bit like this. It's a, an eight-layer circuit board. Um, took a lot of work to route this all out. Uh, it's open source, so it was all done in KiCad. Uh, if anyone wants to fork this and modify it, build their own, uh, it's all up on GitHub. This is what it looks like in person. Uh, and so to attack USB specifically, you need a front end board to attach to the Daisho board. And of course, it would have two USB 3 FIs on it and uh, a regulator in order to provide power over the cable to power up whatever uh, device may, may be attached. Uh, the design of this board is a little bit simpler, but still there's a lot of high speed um, traces on here where you have to match them to within a quarter of a nanosecond in terms of their uh, delay delay period. So you see a lot of little squiggly bits up toward the top. That's all matching trace links to, to get all that stuff sorted out. Uh, here's the uh, front end board. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of rework that I had to do. Um, the regulator doesn't actually work on this board for numerous reasons. This is the general topology, uh, you know, typical man in the middle with an FPGA. Uh, you've got a host and a target attached. They both go through phi's. The um, deserialized data goes into the FPGA, and then the FPGA does whatever, whatever it is you want to do with the data. And then you've got another USB 3 interface on the bottom to move the data into and out of a monitoring system if you want to monitor. So getting a man in the middle working involves a lot of steps. Um, 
USB 3 does a lot of negotiation back and forth just to get to the point where a USB 3 device can enumerate on the bus and start transferring data. Uh, first of all, there's the receiver detection, which is a, involves sending a signal down the wire and trying in an attempt to identify if there's a transmitter on the other end, which tells you that there's even a cable connected. Uh, then you'd use low frequency periodic signaling to do a slightly higher level state management to bring the link up and say, I'm ready to negotiate the link. And then there's some back and forth with some training sequences. Um, there's some equalization that goes on on the receiver side of each pair in the link, or each link in the pair. Um, and then some higher level configuration about buffer sizes, um, et cetera. And then lastly, uh, you have a, a link and you can start moving enumeration and data back and forth. And this is the point where I demonstrate how far I've gotten, which unfortunately is not to enumeration, but uh, pretty much everything up to that point. adjusted the projectors, so you might have to move, you might, some of your screen might be off the top. Okay, we'll see what happens. Yeah, projection screen. Uh, now it should be kicking over to... Why is this not recognizing my doggo? I got it. Okay. So, uh, what we have here is a host, USB 3 host, uh, it's just running Linux. And we have a um, Beagle, which is a USB 3 debugging tool. So, this is what we can use to monitor my monitor. Uh, <laughs> we can see the data flowing back and forth. We can see where it breaks and then what I need to do to fix it. And there are still some things that need to be fixed. Uh, the Dysho board is in between the host and a USB 3 flash drive. So I'm going to load the bitstream onto the FPGA, thusly. And if we pop over here, ah, nothing. Very good. <laughs> Sometimes the uh, USB 3 ports on the Linux box are just put to sleep. There we go, and there's some spew. Okay, so here's a whole lot of training sequences, la 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 la, and then we get to uh, some link negotiation, and then typically for about one to three milliseconds, we get um, some just link up, link back, uh, link down, acknowledgements, keep alives, and then breakage. Uh, <laughs> somewhere I'm losing synchronization, probably with the scrambler, um, and that causes the data going back and forth to be corrupt. The host says, oh no, this looks bad. I'm going to renegotiate the link, and we can see it proceeds right back into link negotiation. So, um, it's not where I wanted to be today, but uh, this is actually a considerable feat with all the hardware design, um, with all the Verilog code involved on the FPGA. Uh, we also, in addition to that portion of the pro project, um, uh, another team member on the DARPA portion of this project developed an entire USB 3 stack for, um, for an FPGA. It's all open source. Uh, you can incorporate it into your own USB 3 projects. And that's what we will use when we get to the point where I have a stable link to start sending the data out to a monitoring system. So, yay. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, the hardware appears to be solid. Um, the design, uh, remarkably, despite not having fancy electromagnetic sol uh, system solvers and uh, an actual electrical engineering degree, um, <laughs> seems to be working quite well. And we've got the um, USB 3 stack from Marshall. Um, I can get to where I should be enumerating, and then something goes wrong. Um, and in the process of doing all of this, I have wedged the firmware, and Marshall too, has wedged the firmware on several of the USB 3 hosts that he's worked with, which indicates there are probably some interesting USB 3 um, 
attacks that are, are possible. Um, so yeah, uh, building on what's, what's here, of course, need to get to the point where we can enumerate um, and do more intentional fuzzing uh, of devices and, and operating systems, uh, finding ways to alter the data, spoofing devices that aren't present, recording and play, playing back connections. Uh, and then lastly, you know, if you want to get stuff into the AMP catalog, you've got to miniature, miniaturize. And the code that we're using to implement this for the FPGA can be put onto a, um, what's called an ASIC, which is basically a hard-coded FPGA um, and shrunk down to a much smaller size and, and become more power efficient, and you could potentially create an implant that's uh, disturbingly small. And next, Mr. Osman. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Osman, and uh, I'm the founder of Great Scott Gadgets, uh, which was a company that started out uh, as a fictitious company um, to try to social engineer uh, manufacturers into giving me free parts. It totally didn't work. Um, <laughs> but, but it became a real company right here at Shmukon when I released uh, Ubertooth. Uh, so uh, a few years ago, uh, and uh, so if you know me, you probably know me from the Ubertooth project or the HackRF project or maybe the Daisho project, uh, all of which are things that I've accomplished uh, with a great deal of help from these gentlemen up here uh, and others. Um, and uh, so it's nice that, uh, I'm able to, that we're able to continue to work together and, and do more stuff. Um, the the uh, the tools that we've seen so far are both man-in-the-middle tools. And they're both things that we started uh, either together or independently uh, before the, uh, the Ant catalog was leaked and before we came up with this concept of the NSA playset of kind of making tools available to everyone uh, and showing people that you know, the tools that the spooks use really are not that big a deal. We can build them ourselves, uh, and here's how we do it, and uh, it, it, it's accessible. We're trying to make things more accessible or, or show people how accessible they are. Uh, in fact, the tools that we've seen so far are considerably, in some ways, uh, more sophisticated than the ones that are in the Ant Catalog. Uh, the only thing really cool about the stuff in the Ant Catalog, the USB stuff in the Ant Catalog, uh, that we're, we haven't done ourselves or hadn't to that point, was the miniaturization. Um, which, and and uh, the, the first time I gave a talk on the NSA playset was uh, Hack in the Box in Amsterdam. And, and that was one, one, the main point I wanted to make was we could build all these things. There isn't any single thing in that leaked catalog hardware or software that can't be done open source, low budget, hobbyist level, uh, except for the miniaturization. I, I made an exception. I said, well, you know, it's, it, it would be hard or expensive or just not worth the effort to try to miniaturize these, some of these implant, hardware implants, uh, the, way, uh, you know, the way that a nation state actor can do. Uh, and I was sitting down at our little booth at the Hackspo with Dominic and, and I was saying, yeah, like for example, uh, Cotton Mouth 1, which we talked about earlier. Uh, for example, Cotton Mouth 1 in the Ant catalog is something that uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to accomplish uh, at a reasonable hobbyist budget. Uh, and Dominic kind of looked at me and said, really? You don't think we could do that? Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, challenge accepted. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we started thinking about it. Well, wait a minute. Uh, in a, uh, all the projects that we've tried to do ourselves are like these kind of complicated man in the middle things. And there's a reason why we want to do man in the middle. The reason we want to do man in the middle is because if we can do man in the middle, we can do anything. Right? We can emulate a host, we can emulate a device, we can emulate two or more of those things at the same time and pass messages back and forth. Uh, it's like the, the universal USB hacking tool would be a man in the middle tool. So, so we had the USB proxy project, primarily Dominic working on that, uh, where we're taking open source hardware and, and um, 
low cost hardware and doing the best man in the middle we can do with it. And then we had the Daisho project that Yachera talked about where we take that to the next level and implement man in the middle at the phi layer, at the physical layer, so we can do more and we implement USB 3 so we can do even more. And, and you know, ultimately the, the Daisho USB solution is kind of the ultimate USB hacking tool. We can do anything that we can imagine with that platform. But it's kind of big and expensive, and um, it, it's and it, it's way, way, way more sophisticated than what we see here. Um, what we see here in Cottonmouth One, it actually says that it has a USB hub in it. It's a cable that has a hub embedded in it, and then a USB device also embedded in it. And what that device provides is two capabilities. One is malware persistence on the host that it's connected to, and the other is uh, RF connectivity. So what it's doing is, is uh, it's putting malware onto the host. So it, if, somebody, if there's some malware on a host and then somebody finds it and cleans it up, well, it just gets reinstalled by, uh, by this device that was hardware device connected to the system. Right, that's malware persistence. And it provides a covert channel. It provides our RF communication capability for that malware on the host to talk to somebody else, some other network. Uh, so the thing can be remote controlled over RF, uh, or data could be exfiltrated over RF. It's really just those two things. It's an RF link, and it's a, uh, a way to talk to the host over USB and presumably the way the malware persistence works is uh, either a, a USB driver vulnerability is being exploited or they're just emulating a keyboard and sending commands to the host to install some malware. Or like, there are lots of ways that part can be done as long as you have a USB device connected to the system. So, so Dominic was saying, I think maybe we could do this. And we sat down and started sketching things out and we're like, Okay, all that's in this, all that's in this kind of dashed box here is a USB hub and a USB microcontroller and a wireless transceiver. Uh, at least two of those three functions we can get on a single chip. And, <laughs> and the other one we can get on a single chip. So, uh, so Dominic said, uh, I think I, I, may, I might even be able to design this. And so I said, okay, I'll make you a deal, Dominic. If you, uh, if you do the schematic, I'll do the layout. And I really got the bad end of that bargain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the schematic isn't that complicated. It's mostly copy and paste from previous projects we've done. Uh, but the layout was a bitch. Um, this thing is really tight. But the, here's the important point. It was not too tight. I was able to use a low cost service, Osh Park, uh, and get Yay, Osh Park. Uh, and get PCBs, four layer PCBs made. These cost $1.50 each. Uh, I'm using off the shelf components that you can buy online. Uh, you, I soldered this thing myself on a hot plate. Like, this is totally accessible at the hobbyist level, even though it's one of the more challenging designs to fit into such a, such a small package. It totally worked. And it's completely uh, doable at the hobbyist level with open source software. This is KiCad uh, to design the board. Um, so uh, let me just give you a little, little overview of what you see here. Uh, I'm not going to go in great detail, but there are kind of four main components you should be aware of. Uh, there's all the, uh, the circles on the left side of the screen. That's the USB-A connector, the plug. Uh, soldered into the board. And then there are little circles on the right side of the screen. That's where the cable solders into the board. Uh, and there's a little circle in the upper right corner. That's where the antenna solders into the board. And then there are the two big squares. And the two big squares are integrated circuits. Uh, one of them's a hub, and the other one is the CC1111, which is one of my favorite uh, RF transceiver microcontrollers. And it has a, a a radio transceiver, a digital radio transceiver that operates at various frequencies below one gigahertz. It has an 8051 microcontroller. It's not very powerful. It's nowhere near as powerful as the digital uh, CPU that's in Cottonmouth One, uh, but it's totally enough to do the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, 
and it has the USB device controller built in. It's good fit programmable, uh, so we're able to get this thing up and running uh, very easily. And uh, I first fell in love with the CC1100 family of microcontrollers uh, right here at ShmooCon, and uh, uh, when Travis introduced me to the IME. So this is like the spectrum analyzer application that I wrote for the IME. So cool. It's so cool. It's so connected. Yeah, you know it, Skylar. Okay, so, uh, and uh, you know, real men carry pink pagers, so uh, some of us have these up here. Uh, I've also made a uh, design, a dongle design, using this same chip, the CC1111, called Yardstick One, uh, that I think I'm going to be commercially producing real soon now. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really work, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it will. Uh, hopefully some of the design revisions I've done within the last couple weeks will uh, fix the uh, RF section. But uh, that's the only reason it hasn't been produced yet is because uh, previous versions uh, were kind of broken. But, uh, but I've worked with this chip a lot and shrinking it down, uh, also this, the uh, Tourcon 14 badge was similar, same chip. Uh, so we were able to copy kind of Yardstick 1 stuff and Tourcon badge stuff and, and make the turnip, turnip school. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, assemble. Uh, so you can see the top side of it is the CC1111. And that's mostly what's there. Uh, and so it's the microcontroller and radio. And then the bottom side is a USB hub. Uh, this is totally assemblable on a hot plate with uh, you know hot plate reflow, solder, uh, solder paste stencil, two sides. and so forth. It is two side, two sided assembly. And so I just hot plate one side and then I just flip it over and hot plate the other side and nothing broke. Well, I, I shouldn't say nothing broke. Uh, because I made three of these and only one of them works reliably. So I, I can't really say what's wrong with the other two yet. Um, and uh, you know, I had to make some compromises to kind of fit things into such a tiny space. Like there isn't a real good header to connect the good FET to. So like I just soldered a ribbon cable to some test points. Um, I could make a spring pin programmer for it if I wanted to, but this is only to get the initial code onto the thing, and then I can remove that ribbon cable, uh, and then I can use a USB bootloader on it uh, to load additional code. Now, there's a little problem. There's a chicken and the egg problem. We have a bootloader, and then we have some application code, and the application code can trigger the bootloader to run so that we can do more firmware updates, but what if you break the application code? Then you brick the thing. And if you encase this thing in a cable, how are you gonna, how are you gonna unbrick it? So Dominic had this cool idea, and I think I forgot to put a slide in here with a picture of it. But there is uh, actually on this side, uh, no, no, it's on this side. Uh, anyway, there's a tiny little part. Um, I can't remember where it is, but it's on this board, and it is, uh, uh, a Hall effect sensor, a magnetic sensor. So if you hold a magnet up to it while you plug it into the computer, then the bootloader always runs, no matter what. <laughs> that's how you unbrick. That's how you unbrick it. <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> good job, Dominic. Uh, and that totally works. Um, I, I know this because I have beat my head against it a lot. Um, so anyway, when you plug the thing in. It enumerates, actually, you can see three devices enumerate. The first thing you see is a hub. The second thing you see is the, the R, Don's Dongle RFCAT software. If you, if you know Atlas's RFCAT project, I'm running that code on here. Uh, and then the third device you see is actually, uh, in this case, it's a phone that was plugged into the other end of the cable. Uh, I have a cable right here. Uh, so, you, so you can actually see three things go at once, uh, or two things if nothing's plugged into the other end of the cable at the time. The, uh, I wanted to have a mold, like I wanted to actually have molded plastic on the end, and so it looks like a real USB cable, and I don't know anything about doing 3D printing or anything like that, so I just like put a call out on Twitter last week, hey, anybody want to help out? Somebody wanted to help out! Yay, Kiki the Gecko! Uh, so, uh, I got this in a matter of days. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's an open source design. And I printed up the things at my local print, 3D print shop. And uh, you can see there, I'm just kind of testing the fit. 
I put some heat shrink, clear heat shrink around the PCB before I like tried to encapsulate it, just in case I have to uh, take it apart in the future. It won't be all gummed up as much. Um, but and you see that little white coil of wire on top of it? That's the antenna, and it's coiled up, which is terrible. Like uh, the radio performance is really bad. But um, you have to make some kind of compromise. Like you're not going to have a good antenna at a sub gigahertz frequency in this tiny little device with other stuff packed in there. But, but it works well enough. It's just like 10 dB less performance than it would be with a proper antenna. Um, and uh, the one problem with this is that, especially with the heat shrink, it was a tight fit into this mold. So where there's, you can kind of see the little, uh, the little ribs on the side of the mold. Like those ribs are pushing into the, into the heat shrink, which means that I didn't get 100% encapsulation around it. And so that turned out to be a little bit of a problem. So it needs to be tweaked a little bit. Like the mold could be just enlarged, a little extra millimeter on each side, or those little ribs could be removed or reduced. Anyway, that would be better. Um, I use Sugru, which is like a hand formable, uh, hand formable rubber, silicone rubber, and packed it into this mold and clamped it. Um, and this might have gone better if I hadn't been doing this at 3 a.m. at the hotel here. Uh, but, <laughs> but I started to open it up and I was like, oh, this totally worked. And then, oh, fail. Uh, but the other side actually looked pretty good. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, the, the main reason for the failure, I think. Uh, one is it may not have cured quite long enough. And the other is the, the, the failure point is right at those ribs where, uh, where I, I noticed that it was pushing against the mold. So uh, with a little bit more work, it would work. Uh, this is supposed to be the slide where I say, hey, guess which one is the real cable and which one is not. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, OK, you can totally tell. But it's pretty good for a first effort, I think, especially for something. Uh, thank you. Uh, so especially for something that you can do at home, right? Like all I needed was a friend with a 3D printer and a friend who knew how to use a 3D printer and <laughs> uh, a friend who makes printed circuit boards and all this stuff was totally doable. Uh, so here's RF cap running and I'm just going to do a, a real quick demo. We don't have much time here, but I'm plugging in, I'm plugging in turnip school. I'm, oops, I'm plugging it into a hack RF. Uh, HackRF is good for testing this because it really kind of exercises the USB a lot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm just going to run uh, RFCAT and start up uh, the spectrum analyzer function. So I'm using the turnip school to monitor the 900 megahertz band right now. And then using the HackRF, which happens to be connected through the turnip school, I'm going to transmit a signal. So I'm exercising both USB devices at the same time, transmitting a signal, and then on the RF cat, sure enough, we see that big giant spike. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's actually working as a radio, and it's actually working as a hub, and it's actually working, you know, everything's working. Uh, so that's my very quick demo. And uh, the next thing you could do with it, other than operating as a radio peripheral for the host, then the other thing you could do with it is actually try to use the USB device on it to attack the host. And uh, so Dominic has been working on this, and we, this is just a little screenshot of like the turnip school enumerating to the host as a USB keyboard. Um, and that totally works. Uh, it's totally doable at home. You can do it yourself. It's all open source hardware. Everything we do is all open source hardware and software. Uh, it's online. Uh, so thank you to DARPA for help, the Cyber Fast Track program, Mudge, uh, and Bit Systems, uh, and all the folks who've helped us with the Die Show project. I mean, that's been a huge project for us, and uh, we hope that it will go places, it will continue to be able to work on it in the future. Uh, and thanks to a whole bunch of other people. Um, and I don't think we have any time for questions, but you can, we'll, you know. We'll take them outside. You, do we have 10 minutes? Do we have any time for questions? No, the stop no. sign is being held up right now. So, you know, assault us in the hallways. 
we could have a lot more URLs up here that we don't, but all of these projects are like on GitHub, I think. Yeah. Uh, and like everything we've done is open source and published. So, you know, search engines are your friend. Thank you for coming. <laughs>